Mark chapter 10. And he arose from thence and cometh into the coast of Judea by the farther side of Jordan. Gives the location. And the people resort. There's a word resort by a sea coast, you know. You got you to stay with the Bible. Go ask the people who, who own a resort and run a resort. Why is it called resort? Unto him again, and as he want, won't, one of those weird English words, he taught them again. So he's taught them before because he taught them again. And the Pharisees came to him. Uh oh, you know that, that music in life you see in, you hear in television, dun, 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 and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? Did they really want an answer? No, they want to tempt him again. They're trying to catch him in his word. They're, they're trying to destroy Jesus Christ through the law. If they can get him to violate the law, that's it. He's gone. He's dead. He ain't God. He ain't the Messiah. And those are doing it in front of people. They're trying to get him with a multitude of people. Remember before they, they're trying to seek false witnesses against him? They're trying right now trying to get proper witnesses. But he's God. He's right. Always will do right. And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? Going right back to the law. What did Moses say? What did the law say? You want to ask me about the law? So what's the law say? And notice as he answered them in view of the people. Now, you're dealing with Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses. you got two Jehovah Witnesses, let them go. They probably won't get saved. But if they come in your neighborhood with your neighbors... Then battle it out with the with the Bible. Make your neighbors see that those Jehovah Witnesses don't know the Bible. And that's what Jesus is doing right now with the Pharisees. You guys want to come to me with the Bible? All right, let's see how much Bible you know. And I do with the neighbors with the Jehovah Witnesses that come here. First place I'll go to is John 10.30. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Now, you're going to tell me he's not God? And the, neighbor, and the neighbors go, ooh. But if the Pharisees were alone, I think Jesus would just, see you later. I don't have time for you. But there, the Bible stresses in verse 1, there's multitudes there. So Jesus is going to get them with the Bible. That's proper. So if you're in the street ministry, somebody goes, well, how did no one get all, you know, there's no one around. Get out of here. Answer full according to folly. But if there are people there that, that can learn, go ahead. Take out the sword. What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered aloud to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. Proper. It is in the law. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your hearts, he wrote you this precept. Deuteronomy 9, 6. It's against God. But then again, the law said, you know, if you find any uncleanness in her. Suggested for the fact, okay, hardness of heart. And if you go to 1 Corinthians 7, you know, you made a vow for life. So for the hardness of man's heart. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Now we're going back to. Adam and Eve. We're going back to the marriage and family. No sodomy. No woman with woman and man with man. And I'm getting disgusted with this generation now because where I am, there are people just openly, I'm gay. My boyfriend and I, as a guy saying, I'm like, I wonder what they think when I roll my eyes. It's not God's way. From for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Those were the words spoken by the first husband, Adam, when God brought his wife to him. Adam performed really the first ceremony with the words. This is now bone of, bone, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. No man can say that of his wife today. God did not take your rib and make your wife. That was Adam and Eve. And to cleave is not to 
divide apart like a cleaver. It's to stick to it here. Funny how you got cleave that means that glue, fasten, velcro, and then yet you get a cleaver that you can separate me. And they twain shall be one flesh. And they and then uh, so then they are no more twain, but one flesh, permanent, permanent. What therefore God has joined together. This verse is always thrown out there. Are you going to say any relationship that involves an unsaved person, God has joined together? When God told you, I think it's Corinthians. Be not un, 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 unequally, thanks, unequally yoked. Let's say a saved person does marry an unsaved person. Wait, did I say, did, let's say a saved person marry. I don't know, if a saved person did marry an unsaved person, are you going to say what God has joined together? Do you even dare to say that? Imagine the preacher, what God has joined together in this marriage ceremony, this saved person, this unsaved person, and the Bible says they were not supposed to join together. Scripture with scripture. Let man, let not man put asunder. Let no man come in, let no man be the cleaver. Let no man part. That's where you get to death do us part. And in the house, his disciples asked him again of the same, the matter. And he said to him, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. If a woman shall put away her husband and be married unto another, she committeth adultery. So he displays, there's nothing hard more displaying to the disciples than what he already said already. And they brought young children to him. Uh-oh. We're just picking up for chapter 9. Remember chapter 9? He brought a child unto him. He picked up a child in verse 36 of chapter 9. Now people are bringing their children to Jesus. Who's over? Uh, where are they? Suffered a little. Where are they? And they brought young children uh, to him. That he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. Let's get these kids out of here. Get these 5,000 people out of here. Will you get these 4,000 people out of here? Can we have a little time? What do you mean, who, who touched you, Jesus? We're amongst this crowd. They're elbowing us. You get with the disciples. They just did not like the crowds. But when Jesus saw it, saw what? They rebuked. That's talking. They're actually, looks when Jesus saw it, looks like they're actually, get out of here. Go. go. Because it would have been, if it was just rebuke, Jesus heard it, heard it. But he saw it. They are getting the people out of there. He was dis much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Now that verse will be used today. For all kinds of perverted children's programs in the church. There's no posters. There's no balloons. There's no gizmos. There's no toys. There's no candy. They're coming to Jesus. And Jesus alone. And Jesus approves of it. Very I say to you. Whosoever shall not be. Whosoever. I'm having a hard day today. And say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, innocent, pure, trustworthy, I said in the last chapter, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms. Comfort, compassion, loving, uh, fortification you know if, if someone was running around with a gun shooting so what, what would you do you take that child you wrap them in your arms try to you know I'll take the bullet I'll you're safe in me it's what it is put his hands upon them and bless them when he was gone forth into the way they came they came one uh, 
there came one running and kicked I'm having a bad day today. There came one running and kicked him. Yeah. And kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now I think this guy here is rich on your ruler. I think he met good master with respect. Because what drove him away, he's not asking a question to tempt him. What drove him away is his riches. I think he's really coming to Jesus and saying, when you read his story in Matthew and Luke, he doesn't debate with Jesus. He's coming to Jesus. And Jesus said, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. Now that verse will be thrown at you by the Jehovah Witnesses. See, Jesus can't be God because he said, I'm not good. Yeah, and Jesus is in, the, is in the flesh. He's sleeping. He's eating. He's drinking. He's getting tired. He's sighing. He's getting angry. He is God. And then again, another thing is that maybe this guy is, you know what? Maybe he is tempting God. And and some say, well, calls me good. You're really calling me good. You don't believe who I am. And they're taking it when he says good master as a thing of sarcasm. If he's coming to Jesus not believing, then yeah, that would be right. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, he dropped the good. He did not see Jesus as God. I believe he came to Jesus in good aspect, but when Jesus said, Why calls me good? There's only one that is God and one that is good. So when he says, Addressed Jesus again, he drops the good, saying, I don't believe you're God. So the Jehovah Witnesses uses this verse and they kill themselves because they are all based upon works. All these have I observed from my youth. There's no rebuke from Jesus Christ. He said, I've done this all. I can't say that from my youth not no and you see what the stronghold the Pharisees had at the teaching the Pharisees were so strict that this guy could say from his youth he was doing everything he was supposed to be doing the works were clean the works were pure and yet the nation is diseased it's filthy. It's away from God. They're washing their hands, but their hearts are not washed. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Well, that's remarkable. He has dropped God as a title to Jesus, and Jesus loved him. This guy's being honest to Jesus. And said unto him, One thing thou lackest. And I think you can teach anything you want about this rich young youth ruler. But look at what his conduct is to Jesus, and look at Jesus' conduct back to him. There's no rebuke. There's, Woe unto you, rich young youth ruler. Thou hypocrite. There's none of that here. He says, I, I love you. I want you to do right. You've done right. Now do right her. One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come, take up the cross, and follow me. Well, that's not church age doctrine, is it? I remember I spoke to you a couple chapters before. Take up that cross. Come, let's go be crucified by the Roman government. Let's go get killed. And do it poor. When Jesus died on that cross, what did he have? 
He had no clothes. He had no jewelry. He had nothing. Just what he was born with. That's it. So he, he didn't even have a tomb. He's telling his man, hey, you're rich. Sell it all. Ain't going to do you no good. You're going to die. What are you going to do with all your treasures? God does not have a register at, at the uh, gates of heaven. He don't have a line, four sins or less. He don't have a spread checkout. He has the blood of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ alone. And he was sad at that saying. What? Take up your cross? Follow me? And went away grieved. What? Come with me? For he had great possessions. That's where it quit right there for this man. Everything was great, but commandment number 10. Thou shalt not covet. He had great riches. He, and the riches prevented him coming to Jesus at that moment. And you remember the, the parable of the sower? Remember what it said? This One of the things were the deceit, the riches, the cares, all that in the world. Here it is. And Jesus looked round about and said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Looks like he just left. He's looking around like, and the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Notice he said children. He just laid his hand on some children. He's rebuking the disciples, trying to get their heart right. Don't worry about the riches. Remember children? Remember, remember we just had an illustration with children? And then the verse that is most perverted by mankind it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And rich men will say that eye of the needle is a gate in Jerusalem. It is not. You can't find it. Not there. Never been there. What Jesus is saying is it's hopeless. Absolutely hopeless for a rich man to go into heaven. And they were astonished out of measure. You think they would be? You think they'd really be dumbfounded the fact that if Jesus said, if, you know, if a camel could walk through a gate in Jerusalem, would, would that really make you? Huh? Well, there's a gate right over there, Jesus. You just look, look camel going through right now. What do you, uh, uh. Don't you think Peter would have stepped up at this point if it was a gate? And they were astonished, saying among themselves, "Who then can be saved?" No. If a camel can go through this gate, and why would there be a question? They know the impossibility of this statement. A camel to go through an eye of a needle. That is impossible. Then who can be saved, Lord? You just gave us an impossibility. Jesus looking upon them saying, With men it is impossible. Subject is salvation. Men. Religion. Paying your way was a way of, this, of this, the Pharisees. The Roman Catholic Church. Well, you know, your, your, your spouse has died. You give us some money, we'll pray. You buy some candles, you pray. God says, with man it's impossible. With man it is impossible. He just threw another hopeless situation out there. Can I do anything for my children to go to, go to heaven? Absolutely not. But with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. So you know, you, you know who do you pray when someone's lost in your life? You don't pray to man. You pray to God. And God say, you know that man there, that woman there... It's as an eye of a needle. That camel cannot grow through there unless you do something. 
Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. He's going, well, we're not rich. What about us? And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that has left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospel. But he shall receive a hundredfold now in this. You know what Jesus has said? You, know, you forsake those who do not want to follow Jesus. You forsake your material gain for Jesus. You got a hundredfold coming. You got much better. Your parents don't want to serve God and do right? Man, think of all the all the people in heaven now, mothers and fathers who love the Lord and just take you in. You don't have no children that will serve God and do right. Look at all the children you get by going out and doing what God said. Witness. Go to all the world and preach the gospel. Support missionary. Look at all the children you can get that way. House. Left my house to go serve the Lord somewhere. Anywhere. Could be America. Could be a... And you trade that house in for what? A mansion. Isn't that great? You'd give your lands up. Well, I'm going to give this land. I'm going to sell it. I'm going to they were doing that in the book of Acts. I'm going to give it for the work of the ministry. Okay? You ever see the dimensions of New Jerusalem? A street of gold? But he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. Ooh, that's a, it's kind of hard for Paul. He ended up in jail his entire life. Had a couple parchments. Houses, brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands with persecutions, and in the world to come, ever, excuse me, eternal life. Now that's a verse that really shoots down the church age because the Bible says for the church age, all they that live godly shall suffer persecution. Yeah, that's right, but people on the radio would love to say, Give me $100, and God will give you $10,000. But you do get the brethren if you witness and do right and support missionary. You do get brethren. But many that are first shall be last, and last shall be first. That's a very important statement. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem's a mountain. Leave the words alone. Perfectly right. They're going up a mountain again. Follow the life of Jesus and those disciples. I get tired. Mountains, mountains, mountains. And Jesus went before them, and they were amazed. As they followed, they were afraid. He took, and he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him. I don't know what they became fear of. That he stepped forward. They're afraid to go to Jerusalem. The word must be out. They want Jesus dead. Saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man shall be delivered into the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. Each time he's telling through the Gospels, he gives more and more details. Notice that. He's given more details than the last time he's given. And they shall mock him. And shall scourge him. And shall spit upon him. And shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. Oh, hold Jesus. Stop. Stop right here. We're having a hard time understanding this, Lord. Can you tell us exactly what's going to happen? Can you tell us what the end of... Not the end of the world. Not the end of the... Can you tell us what's going to be the last days of your life then? Can you sit down and tell us? And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, cometh unto him, saying, Master, 
we would that thou shouldst do for a do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto him, What would ye that I should do for you? Grant unto us that we may know what you're talking about. And they said, Grant unto us that we may sit on one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. They missed it. They missed what Jesus said for position. They never got it when Jesus tells them, hey, this is what's going to happen to me in Jerusalem. Really? Can I be number one? Can me and my brother sit on your left hand and your right hand? Yeah. And then you wonder why they all, when Jesus died and when he was buried and rose again, they didn't believe the women. They didn't listen. They're in the upper room afraid. Who's taking charge then? No one. But Jesus said to them, ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of? And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? This is persecution and death, not water and blood. <laughs> cup is judgment. Cup is those sins that we've done from Adam to the last man that Jesus will die for. And they said unto him, we can. Ooh, that's a bold statement. Almost making what Jesus Christ. You know what they're saying? We're greater than you are, Jesus. Everything you can do, we can do better. And Jesus said unto him, ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I, that I drink of. All right, you open up your big mouth. Go ahead, you're going to suffer. And with the baptism that I am baptized with all shall ye be baptized. Death. You're going to suffer and you're going to die. John didn't die of a violent death, but he was put into boiling liquid. James had his, his head cut off. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to get. So Jesus doesn't say there's not a place there. It's there. He's not authorized to, to tell who's going to sit there. I'm going to assume it would be Moses Elijah. But I don't know. But it shall be given to them for whom is prepared. So that seat's already, already given away. Already prepared. When the ten heard it, including Peter, they began to be much displeased with James and John. How dare you say that? And probably the argument turned to weird. We should sit in that seat. But Jesus called them to him. Get over here, boys. <laughs> well, sometimes you just feel sorry for Jesus. When you just whoever wanted, just wanted to didn't just smack these guys. James and John, the one, Lord, they didn't receive you. Shall we call down fire? And man, he turns around and he rebukes them. You see what kind of character James and John are? They're, they're just, he calls them the sons of thunder. These are, and I'm trying to say, these are not no light, lazy, loafer, faggot kind of Hollywood disciples. These men are rugged, they are tough, they are strong, they are brutal. Even to the Lord Jesus. I bet you cannot make a movie about these disciples. What if you made a Hollywood movie just biblically sound about these disciples in the life of Jesus. The man playing Jesus would walk off the set. Or I ain't finishing this movie. These guys, oof, get them out of here. <laughs> but Jesus called them to him and says unto him, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles, again, it's not Gentiles, it's Jews, exercise lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. It's Gentiles, it's covet the world power, power hungry Gentiles. And you know what he's saying to them right now? You're acting like a bunch of dogs. Knock it off. 
Only those dogs act like authority. Only those dogs will run for office. Only those dogs would be senators. Only those dogs would want to be a president. Knock it off. We're supposed to be about God's business. Dog. Remember the last person he called a dog? Was a Gentile. But so, and that was probably an insult too to them. Because the Jew Gentiles were dogs. They were the scum of the earth. You dare to look at Peter's reaction. I want you to go to a man in, in Italy. Uh uh. No. Jonah, I want you to go to those Gentiles. Oh, wait. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever shall, whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. Get rid of this authority complex. And James becomes the lead in the book of Acts when the council. Not by his own doing, but they set him up to be that chief, that in charge, because of who he was. And whosoever you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, no one came to take care of Jesus, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. And he ends his bickering back to the cross. He told about his death, burial, resurrection, and the brutality he's going to be suffering. We get into a debate who's the greatest, and he ends this debate. We're going, going to Calvary, guys. We're going to the cross, guys. I'm going to the tomb, guys. I won't be there no more than four days. Three days, three nights, I'm out of that tomb. Remember what I told you? Bring them right back. And they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timothy, sat by the highway, sat by the highway side begging. Jericho was the cursed city. Jericho was the first city that Joshua encountered before coming in and settling in the land. And Jesus, when he heard that, and when he had heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, Jewish. Judas, Jewish title, Jewish address, King Jesus. That's kind of funny to see at the end of Mark who sees Jesus as a servant. Have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. Shut up! But he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy. They tell him, shut up. And he gets even louder. Have mercy on me. I like this guy. And when they tell him to shut up and he speaks louder. And Jesus stood still. <laughs> and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man saying unto him, be of good comfort. Rise. He calleth for thee. God's calling you. Aren't you glad he didn't listen to the people? Many people tell us in, in, in street ministry, shut up, we don't want to hear that. Let's keep on going. Because maybe one day God will call a blind Bartimaeus out of that crowd. I like to be there when, Bar when a blind Bartimaeus comes to the light and sees Jesus Christ. As I'd love to see that moment. And he cast away his garments, rose, and came to Jesus. Now, he's not naked. He's got garments that probably keep him warm. He's begging. And Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? Jesus didn't know. A guy who can perceive what people are thinking in their hearts. Adam, where art thou? He wants this guy to come up and, Hey, what do you want me to do for you? He wants to mouth to confess. Jesus wants your mouth to speak up. You know when you tell people to pray for you? You pray for yourself too. The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Lord, 
after saying, Son of David, I know who you are. You're the Messiah. And Jesus said to him, Go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight. That must have been weird. Imagine the first thing you see is Jesus. And follow Jesus in the way. Look what Jesus said to him in 52. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way. Alright, you're going to get your sight, go. Bye. See ya. Right? And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. He didn't go his way. He went the way of Jesus. This guy, for the first time, I would assume, receives sight, sees Jesus Christ, and then follows Jesus. That's interesting because he's following Jesus into Jerusalem. I like to be there when a blind man sees Jesus and follows. And you can't shut up. Don't shut up. Because there's a blind Bartimaeus out there somewhere who's calling out to God. And God wants you to speak. 